Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to meet you and to, to listen to you. It's a huge privilege to me, Archbishop, to meet you. Heard all about you. <laughs> okay. And to be involved in any way in Poland is a huge honor for me. We know that you cannot come uh, to Łódź in April for our meeting, but we cannot imagine the meeting without your presence. Oh, that's oh, why. Thank you. Uh, I really wanted to meet you and to ask you some key questions for, for, for our conference. But the, the, the first question I thought about is, uh, I do not want to treat Alpha as just an instrument, as a, as a um, mean to do something, yeah? Because we, we today we have many wonderful instruments and the result is nothing. <laughs> I mean, for instance, we have a wonderful instruments to contact anybody in the world, but there is no yes. community and unity yeah. between people. So yeah. I think Alpha is a wonderful instrument and we will talk about it afterwards. But first question is how you describe the person uh, which is called to use Alpha, the person and the church. Yeah? What, what the kind of person and what the kind of the church we need to use Alpha in a good way? And so it's a little bit previous and yeah. more fundamental. Yeah. What is the church we need? Yeah. For Alpha to use it, and what what is the uh, what is the person, the Christian we need to use the Alpha in a good way? You know? Yeah. Well, uh, the roots of it are that um, I I was not a Christian. I was an atheist. My father was a secular Jew, and my mother didn't go to church. And I encountered Jesus when I was 18 years, a, years of age through reading the New Testament. And as I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it was as if the person I was reading about emerged from the pages and I encountered him. And from that moment onwards, I experienced what Jesus said when he said, I came that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. And from that moment onwards, uh, I wanted... I thought, what's the most loving thing I can do? Because I know the difference between before and after. So there is a difference between knowing Jesus and not knowing Jesus. Exactly. And it's, it's all the difference between, um, yeah, it's, knowing Jesus is life in all its fullness. It's what we created for. It gives us our purpose. Um, and we experience his love. It's, it's, it's a profound change in our lives. And so I wanted everyone to know. I thought the most loving thing that I can do, uh, there's so many ways we can love people, but actually the, the greatest gift that we can give anyone is to introduce them to Jesus. Um, as it says on the back of your, your, your coat, uh, John 1, 41, we found the Messiah. They were so excited. They, they wanted to tell everyone, we found the Messiah. And so I wanted to do that. Um, and I knew that Jesus had said, go and make disciples of all nations. And in the Luke, our Great Commission says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Or in John, as Jesus sends them out into the world. And this is the task of the church, is to go out, not to look inwards. And Augustine, as you know, defines sin as homo in se, in curvatus in se, man curved in on himself that's the that is the root of sin and at, if we curve in on ourselves we become less if we look outwards we become greater it's true of a nation if a nation has a vision beyond it look what poland is doing right now in welcoming uh what now well four million originally but now one and a half million uh, refugees from ukraine poland becomes great as it looks out and, and then there are no refugee camps in in Poland, because everyone has opened their homes, they've looked out and welcomed people in. That makes Poland great, because you're looking, looking outwards. It's as we look outwards as a nation, but also as a church. A church that looks inward, and it's all about, oh, we all want to look after ourselves, diminishes. It becomes small, probably becomes smaller in number too, but it diminishes. 
But as a church looks out, then it becomes greater because it's fulfilling the commission that Jesus gave it. And um, a, a, a bishop from, from the bishop who was the ecumenical bishop of South India, Bishop Leslie Newbigin, said every church, however small and weak, should have a vision for the ends of the earth. And uh, as every church around the world, now churches in China, in India, in all of Africa, all the places where the church has grown, all those places have a vision for the ends of the earth. So mission has changed from you know, like Europe and America going, going out now. Everywhere is involved in mission. Every church can be involved in looking outward and bringing the good news of Jesus. Well, it sounds great, and it's exactly what Francis says to us in, in the Catholic Church. But uh, I hear also quite often um, um, some doubts about it. And, uh, I want you to answer. The, the doubt is uh, like that. Well, Francis and uh, and those who who cooperate with him or who share the, his vision, you know, they they go out in such a way that they forget those who are inside. Well, I think, um, I mean, you, of course, know far more about, about the um, Catholic Church, and, and, but I think Pope John Paul II also had a great emphasis on evangelization. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he had a great emphasis. I mean, you will know a lot more about Pope John Paul II than I do, but, but from reading his, his biography and and. And he had a great emphasis on evangelization, unity, and the Holy Spirit. And of course, um, Father Raniero Cantalamessa, who's been the, the preacher to uh, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis, also, those are the three great themes in all of his um, addresses to the papal household, evangelization, unity, and the Holy Spirit. And they go together. And going out doesn't mean you neglect um, the the flock, quite the opposite. It's the way the flock grows. Yeah. So if you focus on unity, all that happens, and we've seen examples of this in the Anglican Church, if you focus on unity, all that happens is you get more disunity because you end up discussing all the things you disagree about. But if you focus on evangelization, then you it have to be united yeah. because Jesus said, <clears throat> he, the, he said, prayed that we would be one in order that the world would believe. In other words, the world is not going to believe if we're disunited. So I have a friend who's not a Christian, and he said to me, you Catholics, you Protestants, you look exactly the same to me. You both have churches. You both do the Lord's Prayer. You both do something with bread and wine. Whatever it is you disagree about, and I have no idea what it is, it's got nothing to do with my life. But he said, while you're fighting each other, I'm not interested. And it struck me that we've got to be united because if, that, if that's putting people off, the opposite is also true. When we're united, that is so attractive. So Jesus prayed that we may be one in order that the world believes. So if you go out in evangelization, it inevitably brings the church together. Secondly, renewal. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, what we need really is the, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. We need the renewal of the Holy Spirit. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But if all you do is get renewed and renewed and renewed and renewed, you become like the Dead Sea. You've got water coming in. You get more and more salty, but uh, it's not healthy. But if you have water coming in, Jesus said, you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Water comes in. Water goes out. I swim in the Serpentine Lake. It's about uh, five degrees at the moment, mm -hmm. every morning. And um, uh, it looks very dirty, a bit like the church. But actually, it's clean because it's got water coming in and water going out. And that's how we're meant to be. We're meant, we're meant to be full of the Holy Spirit and go out. Discipleship is the same. You can say, well, we, I went, we haven't got time for evangelization. We're all going to focus on building ourselves up. But, you know, you can fill your, your head with um, knowledge. Uh, but the moment you go out, you have to grow in discipleship. Because as you go out, 
there was a uh, an American uh, minister called John Wimber. He's because people are always asking for more meat. We need more, mm. you know, more solid teaching, more meat. And he said the meat is on the street. It's when you go out and you pray for someone. Um, you 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 encounter you help them to encounter Jesus. That's when you you get meat. You grow because. No one is going to believe in Jesus unless we're showing the fruit of the Spirit, unless we're showing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, generosity, self-control. So if you want to evangelize, you have to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Also, you have to answer their questions. So you have to grow in your knowledge of the faith, the, the Bible and the traditions and all the other things you'll have to know because you're going to be asked questions as you go out. So if you, go, if you put evangelism first, unity follows, renewal follows, discipleship follows. The, the second uh, group of questions, I think, is uh, concerns the, the people we are going to. Because uh, I know Alpha was started in 1977, so... Yes, good knowledge. You had it. it was the end of my primary school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think... Uh, now we live in a completely different yes. world and with completely different people. Um, well, maybe there is a difference, but I will share one one experience, mine experience, very important from the evangelization in, in the place I live now in Woods. We have a great meeting for young people. And the, the the subject was the meeting of Jesus with a with a rich youth, yeah. and uh, yes. he comes to Jesus yes. asking a yes. question: yeah, yeah, yeah. "Shall I do to be yes. eternal yeah. life?" And we ask uh, the youth, "What would be the, your question to Jesus?" Mm. And they had eight possibilities to choose, and they voted on mobile. Okay, oh wow, fascinating. And, well, at least uh, well addressed. In, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing the things, and yeah. then the answer was, the, "I have two questions to Jesus." And now, uh huh. So now you go, no, you you understand why is it so important to me? Maybe one of the features of the people today is that they have no questions, or if they have questions, they do not address them to Jesus. But, but this is our fault here yeah, because uh, we did everything to to hide Jesus from their eyes. Yeah, so they they know Jesus as a person from history, yeah. as a catechetical item or whatever, but uh, they do not know Jesus as a living person. Yeah, and not an important person enough important to ask him a question. Yeah, but but how can you describe uh, you you serve in Alpha so many many years? Do you, are the people still the same? Or no, they, no. The people have changed uh, how all the time. Yeah. How can you describe people of today? Well, I took on the the leading of Alpha in October 1990. Mm -hmm. So since then, I have been involved in 98 Alpha small groups. So I do it three times a year, mm -hmm. and I've never missed one. I've done it three times a year, and right now, we, last night, we had Alpha. Uh, I've been there. Yep. Uh, so. <laughs> So um, we, um, so now I was the vicar. I did 96 while I was at HTB, while I was the, the priest, the pastor there. Uh, and then I did one online with the church, one of our church plants in Kuala Lumpur, and now we're doing it in our home. So we've, I've done 98 courses, and the culture is changing all the time. That's why I stay in a small group, because I want to listen to the culture. What are the people's questions now? that are different from six months ago. It's not just 30 years ago. The culture has changed so much in the last six months. The last five years, it's unrecognizable. So all the time, we're adjusting, not the message, because the message is unchanging. The message of Jesus Christ, him crucified, risen from the dead, that is unchanging. That's the most powerful message in the world. St. Paul write, writes that the the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who has faith. And the message is so powerful. It's life-changing. I've experienced it in my own life, and I've watched over 98 courses 
people's lives being transformed by Jesus. So the message is exactly the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the way we present the message, the packaging around the message, has to change as the culture changes. We don't present Jesus in the same way that we did in 1700. But because that was like, we don't expect it to be presented in the same way as 1700. Mm -hmm. But we do expect it to be done the same way as in 1977. No, it's not even the same way as in 2022. It's because the world is changing. and We have to listen, double listening, to listen to the word of God, but we also have to listen to the culture and present it in a way that young people can understand. We pitch Alfred at an urban 24-year-old. And um, uh, I swim in the serpentine with urban 24-year-olds because I want to hear what are urban 24-year-olds outside the church thinking. And then every Wednesday night, I hear from a group of people, what are they thinking? And try and make sure that the course is constant. If, if Alpha stops changing, it will die uh, because anything that doesn't change dies. We're living, living Creek, we're changing all the time. And... Uh, the course is the same. The package, the message is the same. Who is Jesus? Why did he die? How can I have faith? The Bible, prayer, you know, these things, the Holy Spirit, the church, these are unchanging. But the message of the kerygma is, is unchanging. But the way we present the kerygma has to change. Yeah. What are the most important changes in Alpha courses? Then? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll give you two examples. Because I understand what you said that the best, the best way to to answer the real question is to listen mm. and to listen in a small group. Yeah, and probably to listen in a personal meeting. Yes, the dialogue is yeah. a key instrument. Yeah, but how how can you describe those changes in Alpha itself? Okay. So, the format has not changed. It's hospitality. I mean, they, come, they come, came and had dinner in our house. Uh, one of the guests always brings a bottle of wine. Um, we sit down, we have dinner, um, and we have a really good dinner. Um, uh, now the guests are saying, can we bring the food next week? Um, and uh, then we watch, normally you have a talk, at, you know, at HTB there'll be a talk, but um, in our small group, we just use the videos, the um, Alpha Film Series. Uh, they watch that. I can't watch myself, so I go downstairs and do the washing up while they watch the videos. And then, and then um, we just have a fascinating discussion. And people talk about um, what's going on in their lives. Um, and that might be, you know, alcoholism. Uh, it might be forgiving uh, a husband who's left, left you. It might be needing to make a phone call to your mother to ask their forgiveness. It's so... La the, the, uh, the week before last, on the cross, we asked this question. And these questions are pretty much unchanging. Has anyone here ever had anything they need to forgive? Fascinating discussion. Next question. Has anyone here ever needed to ask for forgiveness? Again, riveting. If people open up and become vulnerable about some things they've messed up in their lives. And then... What do people feel about the idea of God forgiving? It's just so interesting. Um, yeah, but it's also challenging much, you know, to, because those questions are very, very personal. Yes. Yeah, but that's the thing. You have to create an atmosphere. It's right to your important part of your life. Yeah. So this is not just talking yeah. about uh, the weather, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, last night... Uh, uh, someone who's come with their partner. Um, they're not married, but they're, they're living. I mean, these are people outside of the church. They're coming in. Um, I don't think she'd ever heard what he said last night. So people talk about things. Um, it's amazing, the atmosphere, because um, it's a unique atmosphere. Where else in life do you get the opportunity to talk about the things that really matter? The purpose of life, forgiveness, what happens when you die? These are the big questions. And so you have a meal, that's the hospitality. Jesus was always involved in meals with his friends, uh, going to dinner with Zacchaeus or to, you know, going to people's homes. So there's hospitality is at the heart of it. 
and then the gospel message, the power of God, and then the weekend on the Holy Spirit, that's the transforming, and then the small groups, the small groups. So they, they get the input, they hear the gospel, but then we don't do any more speaking. I said virtually nothing last night. I just sat there and listened to them talking amongst themselves. The, the, the discussion group is based on this verse. I think it's in Proverbs 20, verse 5. In the heart of every human being is a deep well, and the wise person draws it out. So the task of the host is to draw out from the deep well that is in every guest's heart the experiences that they've had in life, whether that's maybe 27 years alcohol-free, having been an alcoholic, or... Um, going through a, through a, a divorce or, <clears throat> or um, being bullied at school 25 years ago. Or, you know, all these things come out in the groups and you have this riveting discussion. And then what happens is this. We think that we will impress people by how strong we are. So we like to say, oh, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm very good at sport. Um, I did very well in my university degree. Nobody cares. But when you open up and say, I'm struggling with, with alcohol, everyone goes, I, I, I can feel you. You connect with people through your vulnerabilities. And, and what happens is in the small group, people connect and they, they're experiencing a microcosm of the greatest, of the greatest community, the community of Jesus Christ, the church. Just a tiny, tiny taste. They don't realize it. They think they're just on an alpha small group, but they're experiencing connection because at the heart of alpha is Jesus. And they're experiencing the community of Jesus just beginning. And then they get a taste for it. And then hopefully they join their parish church where they, with the whole riches of the Catholic church, or whatever church they're, they're doing alpha in. They can experience it, but, but it's this connection, belonging. In every human heart, everyone is searching. And this doesn't change over time. Everyone's searching for purpose. What's the point of my life? Every young person I, I swim with in the, in the serpentine, they're searching. Some of them are searching with mushroom powder. Some of them are searching with cold water swimming. Some of them are searching with food. Some of them are searching with yoga. Some of them are searching with meditation, but they're all searching for purpose. And ultimately, as you know, the purpose of purpose can only be found in a relationship with God through Jesus. That, okay. Let me collect for yeah. the moment. So hospitality, yeah. I mean, meal, then a small group, the charisma. Yeah. The, well, in the, in the order, it's the it's hospitality, then the charisma. Then the charisma. And then the small group. Yeah, yeah, small groups. The questions and answers which matter. Yes. On the personal level. And um, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is absolutely key. Okay. What else? I, I asked uh, with the purpose here yeah, because uh, um, I think in Poland quite, quite often we, we have people saying, okay, we organize Alpha. And it is a little bit similar, but I don't know if if it is a true alpha. Yeah, from the beginning to end, yeah. all the important, yes, fundamental elements. Yeah. So, what else? Well, that, I would say the bit that people often leave out is the Holy Spirit, um, because people because there is a weekend on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, or a day on the Holy Spirit, and sometimes people say. Oh, praying this prayer, you know, um, Father Raniero Cantalamessa's book, Come Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and um, this is a bit risky. We pray, Come Holy Spirit, what's going to happen? Um, you know, what? And people are a bit worried about it. Are people going to get, get, you know, hurt in the process or is it going to be chaos or what happens when we pray, Come Holy Spirit? So some people cut out the weekend. And I always say, it's like, I don't know what, would Mercedes be a car in Poland? What cars do you have in? We what, have all cars now. What's the what, what car will people know best? The best car, I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, they were known. It would be Skoda. Skoda. Okay, yeah. you've got a Skoda car. Okay, you've got a Skoda car, and you say, 
what is the record of Skoda in accidents? Well, one in every thousand Skoda is involved in an accident. So how could we avoid any Skoda ever having an accident? Very simple. Take out the engine. Take out the engine and there'll be no <laughs> crashes at all, but it won't go anywhere. And you, know, you take out the Holy Spirit and you won't have any accidents, but it won't go anywhere. And I've read, you know, 98 courses, I've read thousands of questionnaires. And we asked this question, were you a Christian when you started the course? No. How would you describe yourself now? Christian. When and how did the change occur? On the Holy Spirit weekend, when I experienced God's love. Because everyone's searching for purpose, everyone's searching to belong, but supremely, everyone is searching for love to know that they're loved. We know that in our heads that we're loved because St. Paul wrote, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. We know through the cross that we're loved by God. Jesus died for us. But we experience his love through the Holy Spirit. St. Paul writes, the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And it's that experience of the Holy Spirit that is transforming. Yeah, you know, it makes me remember what one of our bishops told me once, that we live in a culture of uh, information. Information, information, yes. information, so that, that um, the, um, weekend edition of New York, New, York, New York Times brings you as many information as a person living in 19th century had to absorb through the whole life. Yeah. And it comes with only one newspaper. Yes. yes. And then after a week, you got the next one. Yes. So you, there is no chance absolutely to absorb all this knowledge you get. Yes. But there is no sense behind. Yeah. And the <coughs> sense is what you said. The feeling. It's the feeling. It's the experience. So again, how, how, is, how people changed in the last 30 years or so? Yeah. Uh, people want experience. That's the question they're asking. Mm -hmm. Not just is it true, but can I feel it? Uh, can I experience this? And that's why, the, to begin with, when we started uh, back in 1990, the weekend on the Holy Spirit was like, oh, we're a bit nervous of that. The evening on healing, mm -hmm. people were like, oh, that seems very like a bit, bit weird, healing. Now, Healing is not a problem. Everyone's, all my friends, they're all into healing, self-healing. Um, you know, it's all into healing. That's not a, not a subject that they're uninterested in. They're very interested in healing. Experience of God's love. That, you know, that's, they're really, that's, that, they want that. So the parts of the course that were more difficult before. Now, the parts that have become more difficult are the Bible. Because 30 years ago, people thought, Bible is a good book. Now they think the Bible is toxic. It's got, it tells us things that are really unhelpful. Um, and forbidden. Yes, yeah, we don't like the Bible. It's a toxic book. Telling others, we don't like that because you can feel anything you like yourself. It can be true for you, yeah. but don't tell anybody else what to believe. That is my opinion is. That's fine, but don't try and tell someone else. Yeah. You know, don't tell, tell anyone else that what they're doing is not right or that this is, would be better or that that is, that is regarded again as toxic. So, so we just have to work out how do we communicate these things. Um, and you know, now the, the talk on the Bible, we ha we're going to have to emphasize, again, e even uh, you know, between filming last time and the next filming which we're doing coming up, the talk on the Bible will emphasize how good the Bible is how it's led to women's liberation, it's led to the abolition of slavery, it's led to human rights, it's led to all these things. Um, uh, so, you know, we have, to, we have to show that now because we assumed that before, that people would say, oh, the Bible, that's good. But now you have to show people outside the church that it's good. And how is it with the church? Again, the, the, the next topic here, the church. Is it easy now or it is more difficult than difficult? It's easier now. It's easier now. Um, you know, what we do on our is we take, for example, you know, if you, uh, in the Catholic Catechism, the, the, the different images 
of the church. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we'll talk about them, but we use slightly different words. So the church, I'll say, why I love the church. Number one, it's about friends. Jesus said, I've called you friends. Number two, it's about family. Um, you know, we're all sons and daughters of God. The church is the family of God. Uh, number three, it's about Jesus, uh, the body of Christ. So we don't use so much the terms that, you know, like in the, in the Catholic Catechism, it might say the body of Christ, temple of the, temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like all these, but we'll use, so te- instead of temple of the Holy Spirit, we'll say home, which relates to people. People can understand home. Um, and uh, it's a place where the Holy Spirit lives, the temple. Um, and for the bride of Christ, it's love. Uh, there's this, you know, the God, the church is the place where you experience the fact that yeah, Jesus but the loves experience you. is not just, uh, it's not such a simple thing, yeah, to experience the church as a group of friends or as a family, a house, so on. But the, the experience people have now is, it's exactly opposite. Quite well, opposite. that's what they've begun to experience on Alpha yeah. is all those things they've seen. They've got friends from the group, our group. Is already on a WhatsApp group together. They are they are communicating today about what they experienced last That's night. The answer, you know, the, you, friend, for the different experience of the church. Yeah, you're giving them the of the church, system. and then as they join the parish, the parish changes because yeah, but they they expect the parish to be changed also. Well, because they're not going to stay yeah. unless the parish also is a place where they experience friendship, family, love, Jesus the Holy Spirit. So as you have new people coming into the church, you have to change the church. Well, this is the importance uh, notice for the parish priests here. If you want to start Alpha, be ready to to transform your parish. If you are not ready for the changes in the parish, do not use Alpha because the people when will they, get something and then they will go away because they yeah. cannot find the same yeah. experience. It, it, it's a constant challenge. When you have new people always coming into the church, average age, that average age on the, the, the course here is 27. Mm-hmm. You've got all these young people coming to faith, very new to faith. They don't know everything, anything. Your homily has to think, how am I going to address not just the needs of the people who've been there for 30 years, but the ones who know nothing? Yeah. Um, how do I address their needs? Um, the music, um, h- how do I make sure that the music doesn't put off people who are 25. Um, had, so I, the question I always ask is not what do I like? I mean, I like totally different from what the 24-year-olds like because I'm old. But it's, what I like is irrelevant. But I can easily understand it because when we meet uh, evangelization with youth, they always start to sing rap. Yeah, I yeah. I cannot follow the yeah, dance. Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't choose it. But... But I, it's irrelevant what I like. Who, yeah. And I just say to the congregation, mm. it's irrelevant what you like. We are on a, we're on a mission. We're on the mission to reach the world. What matters is how can we, how can we, how can we bring these people to Jesus and, and into the church? How can the church be a place where they feel at home? And then actually they love it because suddenly the... Older people see all the young people. I was with the church plant in Liverpool this weekend. And originally there'd been about 20 people in that church left. 20 people, all in their 70s. And we did a church plant. We sent people from London. About 20 people went. And it's now, uh, they've got uh, well over 300 in the church. Mainly young people. But the old people are so thrilled. They didn't like, at first they were a bit worried, but now they look around, they've got all these people who love them, who come and visit them if they're sick, um, who um, want to learn from their wisdom and their experience. And it's exciting. You, you, uh, th- that mixture of ages and seeing young people coming into the church. Yeah, yeah, we have to make sacrifices sometimes. We may not always get exactly the service that we want or the music we want, but the, the reward is so great because we're seeing people encounter Jesus. Life, they're hearing the stories of people's lives. They're hearing the stories that, that, of the Iranian refugees who are coming and encountering Jesus. There was someone from Afghanistan 
um, giving his story. He'd run out Alfred in Farsi. Um, they're baptizing people. Um, so many people. Uh, I'll be in the church in Kuala Lumpur. They baptized 45 people this Sunday. New people coming into the church who've never been baptized. There, of course, they're brought up as Buddhists or, or um, free thinkers. They've never been to church. Um, for some, it might be confirmation uh, because they were baptized, but maybe they never went to church. Uh, so, yeah, it just made, it's an exciting place. Church is an exciting place to be. It should be. But it's great that the, the church is ahead of us and the gospel is ahead of us. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. It's Jesus. Not in the past. The presence of Jesus. That's what people, that's, it's the present, God's presence. That's where the, the temple, the temple that is a picture of God's presence, isn't it? God's presence filled the temple in the Old Testament. And now he filled that, that passage in Ephesians with the church is made up of people. But God's presence, when we come together, we experience God's presence. Well, I think we need to, to learn. But, but uh, at the end, a special invitation for Polish priests and uh, leaders, lay leaders, and uh, pastoral councils in the parishes. Can you invite them to use Alpha and to, and, um, to experience what you experience here? Oh, just yeah. to, I certainly can. Not to me, to them. Oh, to them, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll look at the camera. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's a huge privilege for me to be with your Archbishop and to be with all of you today in this wonderful conference. And as I said earlier, I have such huge admiration for the nation of Poland and for what you're doing right now in uh, opening your homes to one and a half million refugees who are still there. You have two, you have two with your, in your own house, don't you, and they're, and they're two four, because four, children. Like four, yes, four, <laughs> including the children. But it's such a one, you know, it's a what it's, and I'm, I'm longing to, to, would lo I wish I could be with you because um, I know on, I, I've met so many amazing- We will, we will keep it in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, how amazing all our friends are in Poland, um, and um, we're here to serve you in any way we can. If there's any way we can help, um, and uh, there's a team um, who, we have an Alpha office, there are lots of churches in Poland that are already running Alpha, and I often think the best way, if you want to start running Alpha, is to talk to another priest who's running it um, successfully in their own parish, and to, to, learn, to learn from them how to do it, but it's very, very simple. It's not complicated. Um, uh, you know, when I did my, this is the first time I've done it. I've done it, doing it in my own home, doing it in our own home. I had to Google how to run an alpha course um, because I would never done it like having to do it. Normally it's all done. Um, but uh, what I just, the bit that I found hard is getting the, getting it from, well, downloading the videos and then getting it onto the screen. But I got, and eventually I had to get some help with that. But all the rest is simple. We give them some food. We watch the video together. I do the washing up while the video is on, but that, you don't have to do that. And then we talk. And um, somebody calls time at 9.15. And it's always like, oh my goodness, is that it already? Uh, that it's just such a, and then people want to go on talking afterwards because it's, it's such fun. So um, I'd encourage you if you've never, never given it, n never done it before, and you'd like to give it a go, to ask somebody who's experienced it in their own parish, and uh, and we're help, we're here to help in any way we can. God bless. Thank you very much, Nikki. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>